I got Diaz telling me that he wants to go back out. When I told him, when he got done in the eighth, that he was done. And he was like, no, I'm, I'm going back out. I was like, no, you're done. We're going to not only tie, we're going to win it, and Peterson is going to be ready. What is it that you love so much about Tyrone Taylor? This guy, Tyrone Taylor, special human, always ready. And then whenever you put him in, you know you're going to get a good at bat. You're going to get elite defense plus base runner. And just that smile on his face, the joy, uh, it's just fun to be around. So we're lucky to have him, and uh, he's a huge part of this team. What were the feelings in the dugout when Pete Alonso stepped up to the plate in the ninth inning? We get to the ninth inning, and the whole time I'm thinking, give Pete a chance. Just one of you guys need to get on and just get the time run at the plate. Lindor works an unbelievable at bat again. When he gets on, I'm like, okay, one more. Let's get the big boy. So I'm looking to my right, and I'm the whole time I'm telling myself, this is the moment right here. Hey, thanks for meeting us at the Apple. I'm Vito Khaleesi. You can follow me on Twitter at Vito F. Khaleesi. That's Jonathan Barron on Twitter at JMB9191. And today we are meeting at the Apple with manager Carlos Mendoza. Carlos, we saw you right before the team left the final home stand of the year. You said to us this was not going to be the last podcast we do. Here we are right now off the back of a gigantic Pete Alonso home run. I heard you after the game say that you told everybody – we just got to get the big boy up to the plate. Jose Iglesias said he went up in the eighth inning and said to Pete, if you get up, you're going yard. What were the feelings in the dugout when Pete Alonso stepped up to the plate in the ninth inning? Yeah, um, not only I told you guys that it wasn't going to be the last podcast, I told you guys that we were going to be back playing baseball at City Field. So we got that going for us. Um, but look, uh, what incredible moment. Um and you can just feel it, you know. Uh, and this is a team that has been punched in the face so many times. We've been through so much adversity through the whole year. And that was uh, the case a couple of days ago. Lost that game, too, uh, when we were really close. Uh, we didn't get the job done. Uh, and then playing do or die game, uh, we get knocked down in the seventh inning with back-to-back -back homers. And I didn't, I didn't see or sense any type of panicking. We were calm, uh, and it, it was a good feeling. I made a pitching change, went in, uh, got Budo, got Diaz in the game, and while we were waiting for Diaz, I was telling Lindor, Pete, Iglesias, Vientos, and Alvi, like we're gonna have good at bats, we're gonna come back, and we're gonna win this game. Um, that's right. Pete was like, "Yeah, that's right." Uh, Lindor, same thing. It's like, yeah, you're right. We got this. Um, and, man, we get Diaz, unbelievable job. We get to the ninth inning, and the whole time I'm thinking, give P a chance. Just one of you guys need to get on and just get the time run at the plate. Lindor works an unbelievable at bat again, <laughs> you know, and against one of the best closers in the game. When he gets on, I'm like, okay, one more or let's get the big boy. So I'm looking to my right, and I'm the whole time I'm telling myself, it is, this is the moment right here. Um, Viento strikes out. <clears throat> Nemo, hell of a bat, gets a single. Here we are. Uh, told Pete, make sure you breathe. This was before the game, uh, during BP. You know, make sure you enjoy it. Make sure you breathe in between pitches. In pitches. Um, so he got ahead in the count, got a pitch. When he hit it, I didn't think he was out of the ballpark. Uh, and that thing just kept on going. And, man, at that time, the whole dog out is jumping there towards home plate. I got Diaz telling me that he wants to go back out. When I told him when he got done in the eighth that he was done, and he was like, no, I'm, I'm going back out. I was like, no, you're done. We're going to not only tie, we're going to win it, and Peterson is going to be ready. You, you, you got 40 pitches tonight, and you just threw – 60 in the past so it was a total of 100 pitches in the past five days nobody in the history of the game as a closer have done that so you're done peterson is going to get it done so the whole time you know boys are jumping i mean it, you name it and i'm just kind of going through uh uh there's a lefty righty lefty but if he gets to churio which righty i'm gonna go to so i'm thinking the whole time how am i gonna manage that the, the last three outs uh, and man, then Winker get hit by a pitch. He steals the base. 
his back locked up. And I'm like, you're scoring because I'm not taking, I don't want to lose a DH. Acuna's coming in the game. Bader's coming in the game. He was like, I got you. I'm going to score. Marte hits a single. He scores. We saw that reaction. I thought he was going to fall down uh, running third base. <laughs> I, I saw the whole picture and I was like, he's going to go down. And luckily he didn't. He found a way uh score and by then i was like we got it you know we've done it the whole year so peterson comes in lead off single and then you know we get the last three outs and what a way to end it with lindor making that play and turning that six on assistant double play and here we are now ready to go yeah there's there's been so many storylines that this series encapsulated um and I'm happy to hear that that was your reaction when the ball went over the fence. Obviously, across the New York Tri-State area, jubilation. My first thought was, all right, how are we getting three more outs here? Um, and I, I knew that you knew what you were doing. I never doubted you in your plan. But are you sure about that? I'm sure. Oh, I'm sure about that. <laughs> Trust me. I mean, you, you know what we think about the job you've done all season long. Um, there was another moment earlier in this game. We got to credit Jose Quintana for the incredible job he did going into Milwaukee, he pitched there last Saturday, gave up a couple of runs, pitched well, season high nine strikeouts, but he wasn't as effective as he was in a do or die game. And after the fifth inning, people weren't sure if that was going to be it for him. We saw Pat Murphy lift Tobias Myers early. And uh, when ESPN came back from commercial, Jose Quintana was still on the mound and you, you trusted in your starter, your veteran starter. And he rewarded you once again with the trust that you put in him and everyone else in the rotation. Can you talk to us about your decision making there? throwing him back out there, trusting him, and having that decision pay off as well? Yeah, I don't think it was uh, a hard decision at all. I know what the matchup is telling me on paper, and it's not on our favor. You know, third time through, you got the three big right-handed hitters from then. I think it was Contreras, Sanchez, Hoskin. I think it was. Like, not a good matchup at all. You know, on paper, you're looking at it as like, that could be scary. But when Quintana is on, he's getting a lot of ground balls. He's getting weak ground balls. He's getting chased with his change-ups and his breaking ball. Uh, and that's what he was doing. Uh, I don't. I didn't see too many hard contact. So, and I knew where I was at bullpen-wise. Um, and every day, every scenario is different. You know, the night before, I took Manaya out after 86. But at that point, um, I thought he was done. And I was... I, I like how we were set up for the to cover the last four outs, knowing that I didn't have Diaz for length. Um, but with Quintana, I'm going to go back to yesterday's case. With Quintana, I needed him to continue to steal outs. Uh, I needed him to go batter the batter, and he went out there and got three huge outs for us. And the fact that we got to the seventh, Budo was warming up since the fifth inning. So, and he's pitching for the first time after throwing multiple innings pretty much a whole year. So I knew I had Budo for a short period of, of time. He was, he's, he's gonna, and I knew it was gonna be three hitters for Budo no matter what. And I wanted Diaz for Turio no matter what, because for me, that was the game. And first batter, Homer, next pitch, Homer. At that time, I'm going like, I'm going Diaz no matter what. I gotta, I gotta stop this. And um, hell of a job by him, but man, Quintana. I'm gonna go back to Quintana. He's done it uh, for a long time in in this league. Uh, he knows uh, the situation, and he knows where we were at uh, bullpen wise. And he needed to be aggressive and and get quick outs and and stay on the attack. And man, um, what a job for him! Yeah, I mean, look, it was just a three game series, and yet. There were so many small things that happened in those three games that really contributed to the final factor. You mentioned Edwin Diaz. Him striking out William Contreras, keeping that a two-run game to end the seventh inning, was massive. You go back to game one, the decision you made to start Jesse Winker. He had the numbers against Freddie Peralta. He comes, through with the, he comes through with the triple. And then later in the game, Pat Murphy goes to Ashby, and you take a card out of your back pocket, and it's J.D. Martinez. It was, it was so tit-for-tat back and forth. All of the things that you experienced in these three games, these for us, watching at home, stressful, intense three games, I'm sure, and just as intense probably more in the dugout. What did you learn as a guy who managed in October for the first time, especially a series as tactical as this one was between these two teams? Um, I don't know that I learned. Uh, I'm prepared. Yeah. And I know my coaches are prepared. I know the players are prepared. And I got good players. 
So I don't think this is anything new for us. We've been playing playoff games since August, you know, and every game was a meaningful game. So I just like I keep I keep telling the boys, you know, keep having fun, keep preparing, keep keep trust, trusting each other and uh, things are going to be fine. Uh, you're going to get knocked down. You got to find a way to get back up. And we've done that. So as far as like what I learned managing a playoff game, uh, I got great players. I got great coaches. I got great support system uh, that are preparing us and helping us put players in a position where we feel they're going to have success. Uh, every decision is going to work. No, we saw it on game two. You know, with Mayton, he's been huge for us. And that night, he they got him. And that's baseball. It happens. And you have to find a way to bounce back. So um, here we are getting ready for another big series. We haven't done anything. And we got to get ready for a, a, a pretty good team on the Phillies. So, Carlos, there's been so many on-field moments that were absolutely incredible over the last week. But one of my favorite moments, I think, this year happened off the field. And that was Howie Rose's call. And seeing the clip the Mets put up on their Instagram and their Twitter today of Howie Rose sitting on the plane, his call being played for all of the boys on the plane, Howie Rose gets up, goes over and shakes Pete's hand. I'm not even lying to you. I'm not exaggerating when I say this, Carlos. That video made me tear up. It was just so beautiful to see. You were there. What was that moment like? Um, um, you know, I had goosebumps. Um, I started screaming as well. I got up. Uh, I was on the front of the, of the plane. I got up and I saw Howie working towards the back of the plane. And then as he's coming back after he, you know, shake hands with Pete, the whole plane is going nuts. I gave him a big hop, man, because uh, this is who we are. We are a family. We are in this together. I mean, not only players, us, but you guys, the fan base, our, our broadcasters, you know, our, our people from the radio, they live and die every pitch. We, and we feel that. And for us to live that moment, uh, man, and I'm glad somebody recorded it because uh, that was a signature moment for this franchise. And it's obviously for Howie. And that moment was all obviously made possible by Pete's homer. It was the only homer that you guys hit in this series. And you guys were one of the more prolific power hitting teams all throughout the regular season. And what excites me, honestly, is that you guys figured out a way to win this series without mashing out a bunch of home runs. In game one, it was hitting with runners in scoring position. In game two, it was timely hitting, catching the ball. Uh, you guys ran the bases incredibly well in game two, going first to third over and over. You were stealing bases. You guys did a lot of the things that the Milwaukee Brewers had a lot of success doing during the regular season. And everyone on the roster contributed, 1 through 26. One of those guys, Tyrone Taylor, who I know you said after uh, one of these games, we don't talk enough about Tyrone Taylor. Well, I want to let you know that Vito and I are huge Tyrone Taylor fans. We have been, we know that Tyrone Taylor is a huge we part of this team. <laughs> uh, the, this, this past week alone, he has started rallies with leadoff doubles. What is it that you love so much about Tyrone Taylor? His personality, not only he's a great player, but his personality, man. Like, uh, we know, people talk about Iglesias, Vientos, Manaya, and, you know, our leader, you know, Nemo, Lindor, Pete. This guy, Tyrone Taylor, uh, special human, always ready, um, never complains. He could be on the bench for 10 days without seeing, uh, without getting an at bat. And then whenever you put him in, you know, you're going to get. A good at bat, you're going to get elite defense plus base runner. And just that smile on his face, the joy, uh, it's just fun to be around. So we're lucky to have him, and uh, he's a huge part of this team. So, Carlos, we saw an interview with uh, Aaron Boone a few days ago, and he said you guys have actually been keeping up and talking during this run. Um, they're getting ready to play, and for the first time in 18 years, the Mets and the Yankees are both playing a playoff game on the same day. What have those convents been like between you and Booney? Yeah, uh, we're keeping it short, you know, because he knows I'm busy. And it's more like good luck than nice going, you know. And then he's like, um, how are you doing? Good. I mean, pretty basic. Uh, you know, we got too much on our plates. He's doing his thing. I'm doing our thing here. Um, we got a chance. We got a chance, so we just got to continue one, one one day at a time, one series at a time, see what happens. And you've been in the dugout for New York playoff baseball in the Bronx with Booney, but we got a brand new experience coming our way on Tuesday and possibly, wait. possibly Wednesday night here at City Field. And I'm at the ballpark right now, a lot of preparations. 
a lot of a lot of big stuff is being planned. How excited are you and the boys? Because I know fans have been begging, especially when we started rolling out some cool elements, the pitching change, the lighting sequence on home runs, all the incredible things that we've talked with you about all season it's a show. long. It's a show. It's a show, man. And it's going to be a show like we've never seen before come Tuesday night. And fans have been saying, man, just get me to that playoff game at City Field. This is a place that no one wants to come play. And it's happening now, thanks to you and all the guys in the clubhouse. How excited is everybody to come home and uh, embrace this fan base and just blow the proverbial roof off of City Field? That's right. And that's what we are expecting. We can't wait to go out there and feel the energy, you know, just embrace the whole situation. I couldn't believe how many people uh, were at the stadium yesterday watching the watching our game. That was pretty amazing. People started sending me uh, videos of it. I'm like, wow, imagine this on Tuesday. Uh, I told you guys, and I keep saying it, we got to continue to believe. I want, you know, we want the fan base to continue to believe, to continue to embrace it, to continue to stay positive. Uh, this is a special team, and whatever happens, happens. But we feed of you guys. Um, and, man, if it's 46,000 people that City Field holds, well, we want 50,000 people. We'll find a way to squeeze <laughs> everyone in there. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but, again, um, not getting too far ahead. We got a big uh, two games here in Philly and uh, one day at a time in Tallinn. You know, Carlos, we talked about this on the podcast last night right after the game, but you bring up that watch party at City Field and it's so representative of this Mets season because when you go back to those days in the early part of the year, the 0-5 to OMG moment, to think that there were probably more fans last night watching you guys on the road to collectively enjoy that moment shows you how much how far this team has come and how much you guys have really affected a fan base of people who are just rooting for you every night. And one of the biggest people that is a part of that is Francisco Lindor. And how incredible was it for you to see somebody who's he's obviously had struggles with his back over the last few weeks and fought his way back. Uh, that moment against Milwaukee over the weekend when he slid home and then crawled over and got up was just like an image I'll never forget. And then last night, that image of him sprinting to second base at full force because he was like, I'm going to be the one to make the final out. I'm getting juiced up just talking about it. What's it like to see somebody like him be able to have that moment last night? Yeah, I don't think you could have scripted better, you know. Uh, and let's go back to Monday, that game in Atlanta, that at bat. You know? yeah, no big deal, <laughs> that that moment. No big deal there. Yeah, <laughs> you know, you, 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 we're talking about the one in Milwaukee, but, man, the one in Atlanta. Uh Easy to say, MVP. I know Otani, you know, what he does is pretty incredible. But when we talk about most valuable player, Francisco Lindor. Um, and I'm just proud of him. What an honor for me as a manager that I can write his name in the lineup every day, knock on wood. <laughs> um, because he's a special human being. He's a special player. And how much he cares, I, I, I'm going to keep saying it. How much he wants to win, how much, how much he wants it for this franchise, and not just this year, but moving forward. How about some other veterans on this team? I mentioned J.D., the big hit that he had off the bench in game one. How about the job that Starling Marte did during this series, getting on base, stealing bases, the huge go at, or, uh, excuse me, the huge insurance single that he delivered in the ninth inning after Jesse Winker gets on base and steals a base. Just the overall depth that you guys have, how much of a weapon is it for you to be able to really match up with anybody? No matter what reliever another team brings in, you have an answer. No matter what late inning decision you might make, whether it's for defense or a pinch hit, you always have an answer, it seems, with the 26-man roster you have to work with. Yeah, and you got to uh, give credit to Davy Stearns and his people by giving us that type of depth and versatility. Um, we, I'm going to go back to Marte. Um, it's been hard for him. You know, He went down with an injury. And when he got back uh, on the active roster, uh, we were watching him closely. Um, and, you know, there was times where he wanted to play that third game in a row. And I say, no, you're not. Um, and this is the reason why. Because when we got to this position in October, I, I felt like I needed a ride him. Uh, and, man, he's stepping up big time. Um, the bats, the base running, the defense, uh, the energy, like he's into every pitch. Like, this is an elite player. I mean, there's a reason why he's had the career he's had. When he's healthy, special. So, um, yeah, another piece here uh, of the puzzle. Mendy, I got one more here for you. 
your speeches you gave the clubhouse after you guys clinched in Atlanta and after you guys won in Milwaukee. The cameras were in the in the clubhouse and we all heard them. And, you know, another goosebump moment, uh, just so genuine. And what you said, I know it resonated through Mets Nation, really. That moment, is that the kind of thing where you think to yourself before, I think I'm going to go with this or that? Or does it just come natural in the moment where you just you don't know what to say and it just comes out and so beautiful and poetic and impactful and it gets us all fired up hearing it? He just come out, comes out from the bottom of my heart, man. You know, because you know if I go if I go back and start preparing for my speech, I'm probably preparing for uh, having having a good off season, boys. You know, because we're down two going into the ninth. Uh, I'm not thinking about any of that. And then when he came down to ce- the celebration, he came out the way he came out. Uh, I, I wanted to be short because that's that's their moment. I wanted them to enjoy, it, and um, I went with it. Well, it was incredible, Carlos. We were going nuts at home. Uh, we're looking forward to the boys coming back to City Field. I heard that there's a pumpkin that's coming back with them that's been pretty big on social media right now. I hope you got, everybody got a chance to hold that thing up and celebrate. But, Carlos, it's been an incredible year. It's going to continue going. Can't wait to see what Maybe. the boys do in Philadelphia. Let's go, Mets. You can follow this podcast right. on Apple, right. Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. Follow me on Twitter at Vito F. Khaleesi. Follow John on Twitter at JMB9191. And you can follow Carlos Mendoza with the Mets on the road. Head to Philadelphia. Root on your team. And we'll see you back here Tuesday night at City Field.